Hi there, coming to you from Las Vegas again, where I got to meet so many more listeners last night and looking forward to meeting so many more of you tonight because it's Pod Jam this weekend. So excited to have all of you here. And those of you that aren't, I wish you were, but I so appreciate you supporting, listening to the show. I think you're going to love today's episode. I've got another first time guest joining me, Dr. John Duffy, who is a clinical psychologist and author and a commentator on a whole bunch of great media outlets and rights pieces for CNN. But most importantly, uh, we talk about his books and his work, Parenting the New Teenage, Parenting the New Teen in the Age of Anxiety. His first book, The Available Parent, Expert Advice for Raising Successful and Resilient Teens and Tweens. And most recently, and perhaps most importantly, although hard to say anything is more important than the other, Rescuing Our Sons, Eight Solutions to Our Crisis of Disaffected Teen Boys. If you are raising adolescents, if you were an adolescent, you're going to love this conversation. But if you're a parent, you're going to want these books. Dr. John Duffy comes highly recommended from my friend Heidi Stevens, who was on the show, I think, last week. I think you're really going to like him, and I don't want to talk too much because I'm recording this opening literally in my phone in my hotel room in Vegas. You want to see pictures from our Hangouts? Become a Patreon subscriber. I'll share those there and probably on social media, too, so you don't have to. But it'd be great if you did. Patreon.com slash Pete Dominic if you aren't already. Thank you so much for listening to today's show. I think you're really going to love it. I'm so excited that John Duffy joined me for the first time, and I'm sure it's not going to be the last time. Great conversation right now. John Duffy, I have just told everybody all about you. We're very excited to talk to you for the first time. Thank you for joining me. Hey, good to be here, Pete. Good to talk to you. You are no stranger to media. You've done so many different television shows, local TV shows. You've done so many different Zooms. I actually watched like an hour and a half talk that you gave, and I was enthralled the whole time. I got to say, these are hard to give on Zoom for some Canadian school. Uh, how? Why yeah. is media so important in addition to your own uh, actual clinical work, seeing people all the yeah. time? So I'm a therapist. I'm in private practice, and there's things I see in here um, with teenagers, with families that I think out there people are not fully aware of. And so like when you get a glimpse kind of behind the curtain a little bit to what people's lives are really like, what's on their minds, what they're really suffering and going through, you want to share that. And so about 15 years ago or so, I wrote my first book just because I, I thought, I don't think parents in particular are quite getting how different this generation is than the generation that that our generation was the generation preceding them. And so we're trying to parent the same way we were parented and it just doesn't work. So I was trying to just guide parents knowing kids and the way they are now toward a different way, a pioneering new way. I say that all the time. I think I identified that really early at first. I was like, am I being soft? Am I being not my, my acting like it's harder than it was. Then I realized there's just no way to compare our parent generation with those before us in any way because of technology, because of Internet and the smartphone specifically, is there are there other things that make it manage your own wellness and get caught up by the time you're sitting on the couch behind me here? You can feel like I already know I'm a depressed person. So there's something that is not particularly empowering about the Internet. And then you've got a whole different way of using drugs like the drug use culture is so different than it used to be. Yeah. I remember going to a high school reunion. I had a thousand people in my class, Pete. Five of us were doing drugs at the time. We all, I remember going to a reunion and I, one of those guys pulled me aside. He said, who was smoking weed and doing drugs when we were in high school? And I'm like, oh, you and these four other guys. We asked a bunch of other people. We all agreed. But now your type A top of the class kid could be smoking weed all day long, could be buying somebody else's Adderall, like the drug culture is really intense for kids. And because we start medicating people younger and younger, sometimes you get to this point where it's a normal thing to do yeah. to take a pill or smoke something in order to ameliorate your your difficulties. I want to come back to that. Obviously, any one of these things we talk about, and hopefully we can talk again, but you can go deep on each one of these separate things. I even heard you talk. At, and I don't I can't speak to it at all. I just had no idea it was an issue about sports gambling and teens. And it made yeah. me think boys probably, but I was like, whoa, I didn't know that was a thing. Let me come back to that because the other thing, just in terms of one more point about the difference was between our parents' generation is at least with my parents, I think that in many ways they were better by default in that they weren't that worried about us and parents 
fears and concerns get put on the child. And all of my Jewish friends will tell you something different because their parents went, went through, had, had the Holocaust as a story behind them and all that. And they're so more neurotic and they put and I've heard that so many times. But like my parents didn't have those types of fears and they weren't that worried about us. And we went out in the woods all day and we came back bloody. And I have a million jokes about this in my stand up act about how our lives were. They weren't tracking us. They didn't know where we were. They didn't care where we were. There was no worry about stranger danger. The only kids that get kidnapped were on milk cartons. We didn't know anybody. Now my parents' generation, I'm sorry, it was insensitive, but my parents' generation <laughs> is worried about everything. And most importantly, in my mind, the biggest danger is they're worried about shit that is not happening. CRT and trans kids in the bathroom. Those are two issues that I'm dealing with. I'm like, there's real things. Those are not things that we need to Anyway, I feel like our parents' generation didn't worry about us, and we won't let our kids out of our sight, and we're destroying our kids by making them more anxious about just walking around the corner. They're going to get snatched. You just did that. That's exactly right. That is 100% what I am trying to say. You just said it beautifully. I encourage parents to be available. I use that word like a lot. And what I mean by that is usually taking your own fears as a parent, your own judgment of your kid and yourself. And your own ego, move it aside, and then you can parent way more freely, way more openly. You stop tracking your kid. There's all these methods to keep track of your kid, right? You can follow their grades in real time online. You can follow them, literally follow them geographically. And because these things are available, parents, a lot of the parents I work with use them all the time, all day long, Pete. And it is maddening to the parent. And it gives the kid no idea that they are competent and resilient enough to manage the world on their own. So we are worrying about shit we shouldn't be worried about, 100%. And giving in that to our kids and then not worrying about some of the things that we should be worried about, it's crazy. I, I knew I wanted to raise independent, confident young women when my daughters were born. That's what I wanted. And I'm really proud to say that I have. And a lot of that is because... I've pushed them in the deep end. I said, you go in, you do that. You go into New York City, you go in all these places. I'm only worried about the things that we should be worried about. I guess the hardest thing for me as a parent, and I think probably should be for a lot of parents, is giving your child the car keys, which is what I'm dealing with right now. That's a real dangerous thing. And so I'm trying to give her as much information as I can and and work with her as much as I can. But it really has created, I feel like, a, a much more anxious child for this generation than ours as a result. Way more. And and you're right. If, it, if it's a matter of health and safety, the car key is a great example, right? Then you want your parenting radar to be up. You want to pay attention. But if it's a matter of just like anything else, you want your kid to be the general contractor. You're available as an ally or a guide or a consultant, but you are not going to make all the calls for them. If they are struggling in a class, you can help guide them. Don't be the one who does the assignment for them. Don't reach out to the teacher for them. Let them figure some stuff out on their own. That's what youth is all about. That's what being young is for. So that when they're off at 18 to college or whatever, that they're, they're equipped, they're yep. competent. They know they can handle the world. Yes. My daughter's a freshman in college and she's kicking ass and she does not want to come. Back. She does not want to come back home. And that makes me sad. But guess what? I'm told it's not about me. Is that Huge right? Party. Yeah, 100%. Son of a bitch. I know. I'm sorry, man. <laughs> no, it is not about us. This is another thing about parenting, right? Is that part of our kids now, especially with social media on our end, is our kids are part of our report card, right? Where our kids go to school and how well they do, whether they're on this team or in that play or whatever it is. This is part of our identities and we need to separate ourselves from that a little bit. This isn't, uh, if you're, if we're playing the bumper sticker game, we're going to lose that game, yeah. even if we win it. And we're not encouraging our kids to be who they are. Like, not every kid is going to be the honor roll kid. But over 25 years, I've worked with 500 kids, and none of them were ordinary. They were all extraordinary in their own way. They were just different ways. And we have to remember that every kid is going to be unique, and you've got to find your kid's strengths. And it's not always going to be what you want it to be. In fact, it's not that interesting when it is. I love families where... They're so wildly different than their parents, the kids are, that it makes for a really interesting dinner table conversation sure. that they can debate about things they don't necessarily agree on. I get so annoyed by parents who brag a, a lot about their kids and don't have a kind of self-awareness. I'm going to text 
group with a bunch of my high school buddies. And one of our friends, uh, daughters is like a division one athlete. And he's just throughout her high school. He's just always bragging about her. And obviously he's so he's a proud dad, but I would just without confronting him directly because I'm a dick, John, I would, I'll just tell him and the rest of the gang something mediocre or even terrible about that. My kid has done. He's, she scored four <laughs> goals. I'm like, my daughter was just arrested for shoplifting. But. <laughs> Outstanding, Pete. I love that. Seriously. <laughs> when, just, when my son was a teenager, he didn't get in trouble. And I was that kind of kid. And yeah. I remember I was super anxious as a kid. Yeah. So I, I remember pulling George aside a couple of times and saying, hey, man, like, skip class one day. Like, yeah. I, I want to hear from, from an adult that you have misbehaved in some yeah. way. That's I fun. will know I'm doing it right if you screw something up. So I think it's fascinating that you talk to young people pretty much every day, regularly. You have, they're your patients, they're your psychologist, and you taught these kids. And even now, like you're what, 60 and way more about what's happening with teenagers than 20 year old parents, 30 year old parents, 40, because you, they tell you. And I think it really is so fascinating that you've been able to share that so much of it with us through your books and your talks obviously keeping them anonymous, but just tell me just broadly about what you hear. And obviously we can get into gender and, and other things, but what you hear from these young kids that can help, you know, us understand and what we can do better. What the cool thing is that I do hear from them. Like it, it helps me, it keeps me really young yeah. to keep up with trends and music. And, and sometimes I'll like somebody new will come along in music. Some new meme will come along something about like something is new on TikTok. And I get to find out about that. Sure. And I need to know what's going on because that next kid is going to share that with me. And what's pretty cool is I think about when Jewels and Vapes first came along about a decade ago. I didn't know what they were. And I found a bunch of them in my couch cushions because kids will wear shorts in here and they'll just fall out. So I found <laughs> I, I asked one kid, I said, what the hell is this? And this kid tells me like, are you serious? You don't know what this is? Does Do adults know what this is or no? And I said, it, it looks like something that goes into the computer to me, but I don't think it's a flash drive. And he said, oh my God, man, no, that's nicotine. Are you kidding? And, and so I, it, they've schooled me and they want me to know what the dangers are of these things. So they'll walk me through. Here's what you can let kids use. Make sure nobody uses this ever. And so they it's cool how this generation watches out for each other. There's a degree of empathy that I don't remember having when I was a kid, even regardless of gender, regardless of politics, kids have politics like 15 year olds yeah. have a sense of politics. It's wild because when I was a kid, we were thinking about what's happening this weekend. Like we were very egocentric in a way that was probably more developmentally appropriate, but the empathy thing that kids have now is so impressive. They're such kind, thoughtful people and, and they're funny to a kid. And yet, Pete, a lot of these kids don't like themselves at all. They don't value themselves. They don't think they're heading anywhere. They don't think they're how worthwhile could you or ever, useful. Not to interrupt you, but how could you ever like yourself? I'm trying to set you up when everything is better than you. It's just everywhere you look. Everyone is better looking, more well-liked, having a better time, has more friends. Oh, and by the way, if there is a party, you can literally see that everybody is there but you in a little cartoon image on Snapchat. So how do you get to like yourself when everywhere you look, there is a lie being told to you, to all of us, that everybody yeah. else has it better? And you're a zero. It's, it's the craziest thing, right? You're hundred percent right. Thank you for teeing that up. Yeah. But yeah, I, there, there is no way to feel great about yourself unless you can remove yourself entirely from all of that. And I'll be honest, I put a, a new book up on Amazon. I'm watching that ranking and if that falls or if there are some bad yeah. reviews, I can fall apart and I will not look at that for a month because it, it freaks me out. And I'm, 59 years old, oh, right? I heard, so, I heard a story you know, about you that there's another expert in, in your lane who also is now wearing vests and you, you tried to have him killed. Is that right, John? That's your thing. How dare uh, he? I, I don't, I, I, listen, I, I can plead the fifth on this. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> no, but you're saying it affects all of us. No matter who you are, no matter how confident you are and secure you are and how well you're doing, you can always check your progress. And I don't want to tee you up further, but I feel like there's one solution to this, all of this. And I heard you mention it. 
as I think referring to it as going off the grid. When my daughters went to camp because we are privileged as hell and could send them, they were without their phones. And the difference in 24 hours, much less the number of weeks that they were there, two to six weeks eventually, it's everything. They'll tell you it's everything. It's their happy place. There's so much less. It's not because it's in this, in the Adirondacks and Lake George. It's because they're without their phones is my theory. How much of a solution is that? And how on earth do you get these phones out of their hands, much less ours? It's the biggest solution. It's the singular solution it is the more kids are looking at their phones, the worse they are going to feel about themselves. That is a fact. So what parents are inclined to do, and I totally get this, is limit screen time. And it's a joke, right? Because if we tell our kids, okay, you can spend an hour a day on your phone. Kids are going to find other devices, other ways. They'll find an old iPhone in the kitchen drawer. They will find a way to activate it. They'll tap it on the neighbor's Wi-Fi. They're brilliant this way. They're going to oh, yeah. figure it out. Yeah. So yeah, my um, friend's daughter had a, our- an iPad. My daughter had an iPad in between an old iPad between the mattresses. I had porn. She had an old iPad between the mattresses. All right. I should have known. She got me. <laughs> right. Right. No, they're, 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 they're going to figure this out. They're going to get online. So I want kids and, and I am a hypocrite here. Because 10 years ago, I think I was saying kids are too busy. We're Uber drivers. We're taken from one place to the other. Now, post this pandemic, I want kids to be super busy. I mm. like when kids are mm. up on a stage or in the orchestra pit or in the debate room or on the track or whatever, moving and doing things as opposed to up in their room, down in the basement, laying down way too little movement is happening in our kids. And that's where anxiety just builds up. And Pete, I got to tell you, a few years ago, I, I didn't know how important that was, like just moving your body. Like I, I had an idea, the degree to which kids are inert now, so many kids, boys in particular, aren't moving. They are literally horizontal a lot of the time and on a screen. And if those kids are moving, then the screen time falls into the margin. You just don't have time to be on the thing. When you're in a pool, you're not going to be on a screen. When you're on the track, you're not going to be on a screen. When you're Rehearsing the play, you're not going to be on a screen. So I always want to fill some of that time with something that is engaging and taps into something where they know, like, I can do a thing that, is, that has nothing to do with the screen. I can do, I can accomplish something out there in the world. If I keep running, I'll start running faster and I'll be able to have more endurance. And you'll learn a whole sure. bunch of yep. new things about yourself. That you're, you're, I'm capable of doing things as opposed to. I'm staring at this thing and I just feel shittier about myself than I did five minutes ago. No doubt about it. Yeah. I, I think about that all the time and, and, and try to motivate my daughters. We've done a pretty good job. They're 16 and 19 now. And it's, I think often about the day they got a phone and how much I saw change. I think parents don't want to admit this because they blame themselves And they don't even want to be cognizant. But my daughter changed almost overnight. And within a few days, once she finally got that phone, she so badly wanted. What does the research say? What do you think about when the appropriate time to get the phone is? And then there's a lot of nuance about what they can do on it and so on. But the bottom line, obviously, we all know this at this point is it matters as to when their kid, their friends get the phone. That's what matters. So it it would be great if there was a law that's never going to happen. It would be nice if parents all agreed in the fifth grade in your town. And maybe that sometimes happens. But overwhelmingly, it seems like it's a free for all. And I wonder what your thoughts are on it, when they should and do and how close I am to accurate with my anecdote about the change that happens almost immediately. You're pretty on top of it, Pete. I got to say, like, your girls are are fortunate to have you because I can tell you're an open-minded dad. And that's, that's a big deal. But yeah, the age, I couldn't tell you an age where this is the right age. I always go for maturity, developmental level, what your kid can manage and not manage and what their friends are up to. So if your kid's in seventh grade and every other kid has a smartphone, you do not want your child to be socially left out of that, right? So you, you want to start when you feel like your child is ready developmentally. And you've got to use some judgment here as a parent. Is my child out of control behaviorally? Can they can they manage something like this? And start easing them into it. Here's the phone. We're not going to put social media on it for now. Here's social media. We're just going to put Instagram up there. And I am going to be your best friend on Instagram. So, and you're not going to have a Finsta. We're not going to have a second account. <laughs> we'll have one account. I will be tracking that thing. That phone is my phone for now. 
until you show me for six months, a year or so that you are going to be responsible with it. Not because I don't trust you, not because I don't respect you, but because this can get really messy and dangerous for you. And so I'm going to ease you into this thing that even I don't understand very well. So I'm going to make sure that you are not put in a bad spot. And that's the way I always encourage parents to pitch it to their kids. Not that like, I know you're going to go haywire on this thing, but I'm just going to limit the time you spend on it. And I'm going to attend to what you post and who you're following so that I, years ago, I worked with uh, this kid. He was in eighth grade, had a smartphone. Parents thought he's a great kid. We're going to let him go. Like he, he's clearly a responsible guy. (laughs) And long story short, dad looked through the phone just in time to call the police. The kid was about to meet a guy in a, a bathroom at the mall. Like this stuff can get really dangerous really fast if we don't pay attention to it. How closely should we pay attention to it? I don't want to spy on my kids. I feel like I shouldn't be looking at their conversations too much. When it comes to what they post on social media, I, I no holds barred there, really. But they're going to get around yeah. you. And that, as you just mentioned, with all kinds of I, I remember when I learned what a Finsta was. It's like an alternative right. account where you post differently. It's a little bit more low key, et cetera. But how closely is appropriate or ethical to spy on our kids, even tracking them? I had a really thoughtful conversation with my daughters last year about how we have them on an app where we can see where they are. And they both made such brilliant points. What would you do if when you were growing up, your parents knew exactly where you were, your decisions and choices as to where you went, how long you spent there? We have to think about it. We know you're watching us and how fast we're driving. It's terrible. It's just terrible. But so how, what, what, what do you suggest parents do? Obviously, it's to the kid, probably, if they're in trouble. But Some kids want their parents to track them. Yeah. Uh, I'm not a big fan of this. Like I do think about what, the way we grew up, where we our parents couldn't track us, didn't know what was going on in school yeah. in, in real time. I like that. I think that's a way healthier way for kids to come of age. Because, again, things are going to go sideways. That's not the end of the world. That's part of what adolescence is all about is things going sideways and finding a way to right the ship. It's everything. Say more. Say more about that, because this is we are not talking about the snowplow parent who's doing everything. And I don't want my kid to ever be uncomfortable. And it's crazy. They become adults and they can't do anything for themselves. And it's because you did everything for them because you never wanted them to be uncomfortable or to feel pain. Say more about that. Please. Amen. Yes. Okay. So let's spend a moment on this. If we're doing for our kids ever, literally ever, then we're making, we're over parenting. We can step back from that. It is okay. It is important that our kids screw up. It is important that our kids fail and figure shit out. That is the key to parenting. That is the hardest, but most important thing but it hurts me. It makes can, me. It makes me very upset and sad to see my kids suffering. Don't you? Why do you? I'm not. I want to see my kids suffer, sir. Okay, fine. But that is the only way that you'll know when your kid is 19 and out of the house that he or she is going to have the ability to figure things out. Yeah. So if we're playing like a cost benefit thing. That wins. The future wins over the right now, your anxiety right now. Your anxiety is not that interesting. So I I encourage parents, honestly, to work through that anxiety. Talk to a professional if you need to. Talk to a parent coach. Talk to a therapist. Somehow get past that fear of having your kid be uncomfortable. Remember, we were all uncomfortable. Part of the good thing about a lot of the way a lot of us grew up is our parents didn't know what was going on. So we had to figure our way around the bully. We had to figure out how to pass the class or how to figure out like how to make up for the tests that we missed or whatever. A school we- career, as I call it, I was like Ferris Bueller. It made me. And I was a popular kid, a well-liked kid. I-, I had a lot of friends. I was talented, but I was the smallest kid. And all the girls put me in the friend zone and my buddies would always pick on me and everything. But I developed humor and then i wasn't the smartest kid so i developed ways to get around and get as best a grade i could on different things i learned so much in high school about how to adapt to my problems and i just want to be clear i was uncomfortable a lot cringy horrible failures embarrassments but i put it out there and i'm glad that i did because of those four years especially i think it developed me and but i just want to remind people and i was 
if you weren't like my older brother, if you were bullied, it was horrible. But hopefully you were able to learn something from that. And then someday those assholes are working for you is my little prophecy. But I totally <laughs> agree. And I think that high school, like I, I like that little high school career, those four years are so important, Indelible. right? In, yeah. ter- in terms of our development. And, and I love that you figured out who you were. I think I figured out who I was during that time. And this was, if I'm being honest, and, and I think this is true for a lot of us, kind of independent of my parents. And this was seeing myself through the eyes of my friends and seeing what I was good at, what I really wasn't very capable of and recognizing mm-hmm. I saw ordinary people when I was a, a sophomore in high school with a buddy of mine. And there's a therapist in there working with teenagers in Chicago. And I'm like, damn, I want to do that, man. I wonder if that's something that's real. And here, all these years later, I'm doing that thing. I wasn't with my parents. They didn't encourage this to me. They, I was a CPA for years, six years before I wow. did this job. Really? That <laughs> is shocking to me. By the way, I, I had a similar experience, but the film was Ghostbusters. And that career went nowhere. No, there was zero ghosts. <laughs> You had yours as a traditional, oh, I'll be a therapist. I was like, where are these ghosts that we will be busting? And how come my dreams are not working out? I got to say, your was it your first book, The Available Parent? Yes. I'm getting all your books. Everybody should get all three of your books. They're so important because they're so relevant. I think you make that point, too. There are some great books for parenting and psychology. And I think I read all of them. I think that's important. What would you say quickly, though, about those of us that have it, a lot of ambition – to be great parents so much that we do read all these books and listen to these podcasts and people like you and still fuck it up all the time. Or as a result, we overdo it. That's what I mean. Like I suffocate my daughters for sure. I have, especially in the last couple of years as they pulled away from me, I was like, wait, and I kept making those mistakes. I've made lots of mistakes, but I've tried to read all those books. What does it do? We, you go overboard sometimes. Maybe I I guess is my, my question. For sure. And there's, there are so many books on parenting that, that section on Amazon, that section of the bookstore is just getting bigger and bigger. And there's some really good news in there, right? Because there's some really brilliant people writing in this space. So I love that. And I there's some really bad like, ones yeah. too, with some weird intentions and For trying sure. to turn the clock back and hit your kids still. Yeah. <laughs> You're still going to teach them. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Yeah, I, I'm reluctant to name names, but there are some yeah. to avoid. Be discerning about what you um, ingest in, as far as this goes. But by and large, I think what we don't want to do is overparent. You and I are on, a, on the same page here about yeah. this. And not to parents. It is hard not to overparent these days. There are so many ways to do it. There's all the tracking devices, and we can listen at our kid's door and follow all their social media constantly. We can spend our lives doing this stuff. And it really doesn't get us anywhere. It doesn't get our kid anywhere. It doesn't foster any trust between us. And it doesn't show any confidence in our kids. That trust that you want to build with your kid, that's super important too. So I want to spend a moment, if you're cool with it, Pete, on yeah. that because... Uh, yeah, it's, I, it's, every, it's everything. It's hard. It's, 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 I, I know that lesson and I still lose that trust every once in a while and it crushes me because it's hard to rebuild. And so please do. Yes. It is. Yeah. I talk about it in terms of this thing, the emotional bank account that shows up in a lot yeah, of that. self-help stuff. Yeah. And every relationship we have has this emotional bank account. And if it's in the red, by and large, things aren't working. So if there's somebody you're not getting along with, somebody you just can't stand, somebody who talks over you, whatever. If you have a problem with somebody that any intervention you try to make in that relationship is going to have struggles, right? Whereas if you've got somebody where it's well in the black, you can debate with them, you can argue with them, you can screw up really badly in your connection with them and still like there's resilience in this thing. This relationship is working by and large. So I I have space to screw things up a little bit. That's where you want to be in parenting. So what I encourage parents to do is hang out with your kids. Be normal. But kids tell me all the time that parents need to hear is, hey, sometime when I was like 11 or 12, my parents stopped being cool. They stopped being fun. They stopped being themselves. And now they're policing me. Like, I feel like they're looking for the thing I'm doing wrong, as opposed to celebrating the thing I'm doing right, or just getting into watching the thing with me or listening to my music with me or whatever. So hang out with your kids. Most of your time, parenting shouldn't be actively parenting, shouldn't be intervention related. It should just be like getting to know your kid. And that might be three minutes a day. 
But those three minutes could be invaluable if there's no judgment in them. Part of the reason I had a kid was to have someone to control and to tell what to do and how to do it, because that makes me feel powerful. And so that becomes a lot more easy or ever present the older they get. And now they've got some agency and they're making up their own mind. So now I've got to be even tougher on them and to control them and show them how smart I am. And I'm obviously playing this role for you to react to, but I see so much of that sometimes in myself and a lot in other people and even our parents today still controlling you to some extent for any number of reasons. And I, I don't think a lot of people realize they're do they're doing that or why they're doing that. And sometimes it's hard because you just got to let your kids go. But the control thing is where I see what you're talking about. And it flips at a certain age, apparently. Oh, man. A hundred percent. Yes. This is fun, Pete. It's fun talking to you. You've got, you've got this nailed, but yes, we want to control our kids. So what happens in this room a lot is parents come in here with their kids. So we're doing family therapy and they think this is the opportunity for me to lecture at my kid, right? This guy's going to back me up. And I'm just going to tell my kid how things are, what they need to do. <laughs> if they only would do this, things would be okay. Uh, and lectures never work, man. They ne- Kids will not Whereas we might have responded, my dad, I was afraid of him. And so he could lecture at me and I'd be like, yes, I will do what you say, at least in front of you. While you're right there, I will do what you say. But it doesn't really engender a lot of connection, right? And I usually stop lectures. A kid taught me this early on. I stopped a dad from lecturing at his son and I asked the kid to finish it. I said, do you know what your dad's trying? Where's your dad going with this? And I said, and do it in your dad's voice. So he's he's mocking his dad. (laughs) (laughs) And and he'll he'll do the lecture right back. I'm like, okay, so dad, do you feel heard? Do you feel like, does he know what you're going to say? Because your kids all know all your lectures. You've ingrained in them what you think and what you feel. What's interesting when they become teenagers is they start to develop their own point of view, different and distinct from ours. And that is, if we're trying to control somebody, we're going to lose that. That is a frustrating, awful parenting battle to fight. And that's where things go sideways. That's where kids fall into real problems because they don't have you to fall back on. As far as they're concerned, all you're going to do is lecture at them. If they come to you with something, all you're going to do is tell them what they did wrong. Ah, So well said. I remember when I would lecture, I would wait till we got in the car to give them life lessons. So pathetic and cringe to, to think about it. And I'm sure I still do it. So I established this thing because as a comic and as a interviewer and, and, and I noticed the moment that you stop listening, like I know you do. And so I just started calling it out with my daughter. I go, when did you at what turn? How far back? Because we always be driving. Did you stop listening? It gave her an opportunity to be funny. And she loves we love to laugh, obviously. And she says back like two, like about a mile back when we pass that house that has no door. I totally checked out. And it would be so funny because she was being honest. She's, I realized she checked out, but it took me a minute. She told me about 30 seconds ago and it developed this kind of understanding. It hasn't made me stop doing it, but I, once I could get them in that confined space in the car, it was where I took advantage of it. But you have given so many great pieces of advice about how to create a conversation that doesn't end up like a lecture and gives them power and agency. And I've used a lot of those tricks. Tell me how to talk to our kids when they want to stop talking to us. One of them is what you do. Like um, we forget to be funny. We forget that the things can be by and large pretty light, that we're rarely ever in crisis. And if we can get the word crisis out of our heads, I sometimes I'll, when I'm talking to groups of parents, I'll say like, how many people have had more than 10 crises in their lives? And Tons of hands go up. And then I'll say, let's call it like 9-11 crisis. Like that, that, let, 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 and then everybody's hand comes down. Like, I think we have a low threshold for what feels like an emergency <laughs> when, in fact, very few things actually are. I get crisis calls, I swear to you, almost every day, Pete, and uh, a parent will call me. And I'll call him back and it'll be like, I, I found a vape in the car. And I'm like, okay. Let's reevaluate what a crisis is. That's a situation. That's something we probably got to talk about. But if you address it, bring that to your kid in the same vibe that you're bringing it to me, they're not going to, they're not going to have anything to do with you. If you don't have uh, an appropriate tenor and tone when you approach your kid, 
they're going to be like, you're going to overreact to everything. Why would I ever talk to you? And I, and I mean that sincerely. Kids will oh, yeah. say that's overtly in here. Yeah, I've, I've heard it from my own kid. It's heartbreaking when they don't want yeah. when my daughters haven't wanted to share something with me because how I reacted the last time they shared something similar. It is the worst feeling. I'm like, oh, God, I did it again. I'm that guy. You see it. You see it a mile away. And don't we all with our parents knowing if I do this or that, that's the way they're going to react. And even if I want to not react that way, I fall into my old traps and, and habits so often. I've got to talk with you about your most recent book because it's such an important issue. I've spent most of my life and career. I met our, our mutual friend, Heidi Stevens, when I was doing advocacy work uh, for women, for women and girls. And when I started that years ago, and it's always where my focus has been when it comes to gender issues has been on, on women and girls. I have two daughters, et cetera, and so on. But I have recently started to really understand the crisis with boys. And there's so many reasons for it. But you've written a new book that I think is super important. And if you have a son, you have to buy it right now. And if you don't, you're not a good parent, actually. Does that work, John? Guilting people into buying? Rescuing Our Sons, Eight Solutions to Our Crisis of Disaffected Teen Boys. It's so important. But let's start with the problems and why you thought you needed to write this book. Yeah, I, I've noticed in the last 10 years, in particular in the last four or five since the pandemic started, that our boys were really struggling. It was just something I noticed organically in this room. All the kids are going through something, right? The kids are not coming in here for no reason. So kids show up here. But I noticed the girls I'm working with come in here with some light in their eyes and they bounce back really fast. And what and I had to ask myself, like, why is why are these girls so why, why is the day I work with girls so much easier for me than the day I work with boys? Girls have this deep emotional language still. It feels like I'm talking in the 1950s, but this is still true that girls have this. They can talk about every one of their emotions uh, and they do a lot of talking. Just to be they clear, I, I think it might not be just to be clear. Sorry to interrupt you. The day you work with girls is easier than the day you work with boys, meaning you have a day where you see predominantly or exclusively male patients versus another day and you can then judge which one is hard is that what i'm hearing you say not with any deliberation pete this happened by accident mm -hmm. i noticed and this i swear to you this is true i noticed i drink a venti iced coffee right i, I bring to work every day on tuesdays i drain it on wednesdays i drink a little <laughs> bit of it and i, I tuesdays are the boy the day and Tuesday's boy day and, you know, and, wow. and Wednesday just happens to be girl day. Not, I didn't plan it that way. It's just how things fell off schedule wise. And so I, I was able to, I was wondering like, what the hell, why is it so different? I looked at my calendar and oh yeah, Tuesday's boy day and boy days hard because boys don't want to be here. They're not sure they can't, they got mad, bad, sad, glad, and angry as the emotions that are appropriate for guys to say right. <laughs> and, and to describe. And there's also this kind of identity crisis, right? When they think about what it means to be masculine, what it means to be a guy, they'll ask me, I've been asked this so many times, a dozen times in the past couple of years, am I toxic? Are we toxic just because we're guys? Am I a bad human being? Just am I worthwhile? Girls seem better than us, like organically better than <laughs> us. So there's a lot to work through in terms of what it means to be a guy. and. Boys also look at their fathers and other role models, and they're not necessarily drawn to the life their dads are living. They'll say, literally a guy said to me recently, my dad doesn't have any friends. I don't think he likes my mom. He hates his job, and I don't think he listens to music. So adulting doesn't look that good to me. So little that note is to dads, such, right? It, well, that is such an important point, with because I think and talk about men and our struggles, especially in middle age, probably the type of age that an adolescent parent, uh, boy would be talking to you about their dad. And he happened to name a few, but there are a lot of issues around that. And that's a really interesting thing to think that they don't want to end up like their dads. When I was growing up, I wanted to end up ex almost exactly like my father. And I feel like that was a common story of previous generations. Not obviously all some dads were horrific, but I'm saying a lot of us. Yeah. So that's a fascinating thing that just happens, but continue with what's wrong with what else you hear from these boys. And yeah. well, so lacking like a clear identity, yeah. Vision for the future. G girls have this. They, they can see a path, even though the glass ceiling is still pretty solid. There's enough crack in there to let a little bit of light through yeah. 
the the Me Too movement, though it didn't go far enough and we've taken so many steps backwards since then, at least we gave it some oxygen, right? So the girls can see, okay, it, it, everything isn't happening for women the way it should be, but we're, I can see where the future looks a little brighter. They can picture it. Whereas boys don't want the lives their dads have. They support girls in like having something new and better for themselves, but they're not sure then what they're supposed to be and what they're right. supposed to have in their lives. So there's this degree of hopelessness. I don't know what my future looks like. I don't think I'm going to be able to make the living my dad does. I don't know if I want to be a parent. I don't know if I want to be in a relationship. A lot of that has to do with watching pornography, by the way, man. Boys watch way more porn than what is we have the result? any what is idea. The result? Of course they do. And of course, I would have. I won't speak for you. You seem like a better person. But we I, all I I would dig through every National Geographic to find one woman whose culture it was to be topless and be like, I have one, the jackpot or the lingerie catalog or all the things that we all joke about. But these kids can now press one key. It's on their favorites. It's like now a million videos of the exact type of woman doing the type of thing. But what is the I don't know what the result of it is on adults, much less, but I can't imagine what it's like for boys, much less girls who are not watching it. I would imagine at the same rates or even reasons necessarily, but what, what happens to them? They can't then what? Okay. So here, uh, let, let me describe the course of it and I'll tell you what they can't do. So they, I was working with a 13 year old boy who schooled me on this. He said, you, you start watching porn when you're about eight or nine, you just, you stumble yeah. upon it. Some kid shows it sure. to you. Some kid's brother shows it to you. Sure. And that's porn up. That's, that's G rated porn. That's nothing. By the time you get to my age, he's talking about 13. You're what you're in the recesses of the dark web. You're finding like the craziest, the craziest shit out there. And mm -hmm. it is traumatic. It is graphic. It is violent sometimes. And so by the time they there's this opportunity to be with a girl or a guy in, in certain cases, right? There's so much anxiety around what does this intimacy look like? What does sex look like? What does sexuality look like? What does masculinity look like? What is violence look like the whole thing they're they're frightened of it that they tend not to engage it like we're hearing like oh young men are engaging in relationships having less sex than they ever have before that's true most of it is fear like i'm not gonna be able to perform like this guy i'm what i've been watching for years and some kids get to the point where there's their meters are so poorly calibrated around all of these issues that they question like their own sexuality like they're like they're not getting turned on the, the same way they would otherwise. They're desensitized to a great extent to the whole issue of sex. So it's not that interesting to them. A decade ago, I was talking about if you're working with a 15 year old boy, he's talking about girls. Now it hardly comes up. Like I have to bring it up and they're not that interested. Girls will ask me like, where are the boys, dude? Where, uh, you know, like, we're hot. We're awesome. We're fun. <laughs> like, wow. why are they not coming after us? Really interesting, fascinating, and important. And I think one of the other issues I've heard you talk about and write about is that if the boy, even if the boy has a good role model as a dad, and he's a great dad, even if that that's great, that's best case scenario. But the issue is that once you get a little older and you start searching for other role models, for which we have many that we want to maybe emulate or that we look up to what we find is there's a lot of shitty guys who are super popular now and they watch and they listen to them. <laughs> like if it, it, it seems like now a prerequisite, if you were a former special operator, or Navy SEAL, now you get a podcast and wake up at four in the morning and have no feelings and never revisit trauma. But trauma's fake. Uh, you've got this guy, Andrew Tate and all the sexual stuff, Rogan and all his conspiracies <clears throat> and so many others that when we think about listing and I heard you on this podcast trying to list like positive role models, we can't find any that they look up to that they listen to other than like a few athletes, which aren't really who we're talking about. Really, if you're listening to a guy talk on a podcast or on a YouTube video, that's who we're talking about. Somebody like you. But they don't they're not yeah. finding those role models. It, tell me a little bit more about how and because you've listened to a lot of these podcasts, like how influential are those types of people that I mentioned and others on young boys they're listening to and paying attention to? Who do they look up to? I'm so glad you brought this up because they are our kids are developing these points of view 
a lot of it through podcasts. And when your kid's walking around the house and, and he's wearing the AirPods, he's not always listening to music. So you got, you have to know, like, your kid's probably listening to podcasts. And guys like Rogan, Tate, Peterson, like these guys Jordan are Peterson, right. yeah. engaging. They're funny. They're, they're, they all have their own little thing. But Jordan Rogan's Peterson, really I'm interrupting. Like, you're going to say it. I'm sure I'm so sorry, but they tell them why they're feeling the way they're feeling and they're wrong. <laughs> Right. That's yeah. why they're yes. so popular. Yes. Yes. You feel this way. And that resonates with everybody. And here's why it's because of vaccines or I, I don't know. It, it's because of trans. I don't know. Even though what they say, I don't listen enough all the time. And when I do, I can't believe people buy it. But tell me is how much of it is that they tell them how to they feel the way they feel because of this. And it's wrong. It's a lie. Eighty percent of it is that wow. honest to God, like they develop their point of view via these podcasts and Without a counterbalance, like I love working with these boys because I'll challenge these points of view. That's why I listen. Like I've, I listen to more hours of these guys, man, than than, than I can tell you. Just because I want to hear sure. what Good. the boys I'm working with are listening to, and it is, it's really almost creepy if I'm being honest with you because they'll they'll be really fun and engaging and seem really open minded, and then they'll sneak like the messaging of here's why you feel the way you do. Girls and women are taking it away from us. That's why. Anyway, getting back to our point, like it, it's sneaky. It's occasional. And it could be a sports podcast, right? It could be Barstool. 89% fun and funny. And then some misogyny slips in somewhere or racism slips in somewhere. Some closed minded bullshit that ends up creating the mindset of our boys so that really sweet, kind, thoughtful boys are sitting on this couch and they are, um, they are developing mindsets that we wouldn't necessarily want them to have. So what I encourage in parents is don't tell them they're wrong necessarily, but it challenge them. Like at least say, Hey, let me listen to that. Let me listen to that with you for a while. And let's talk about what this guy's saying, because I don't necessarily agree with it, or maybe you do, but at least get your voice in the mix. Because right now, 95% of the time, our parental voices are not in the mix. Our kids are developing these points of view from people that we wouldn't necessarily choose for their, you know, role models. Yeah, I could talk to you forever. Last thing I want to ask you about is simply the issue. This isn't gender specific. This is, this is not even necessarily uh, kids, but it's attention spans. That topic you've written all about this. There's a lot of research out there. I don't know who's right. I don't know what to think. I think the research is not totally settled. Some things seem super obvious, the way phones work and grab our attention. There's data that says we have this many seconds of, of that. My position right now, and I really don't know, I'm, this is straight out of my ass, is that we go too easily to diagnosis of ADHD and drugs as adults and as kids. And the medication seems to have some effect. It seems to work. I don't know wh how much you're supposed to take or how many milligrams and so on. For me, I think I've always had attention issues. Always. I've never taken a drug other than cannabis, which I use way too much of, but it does have that effect on me. But I haven't taken any of these other ADH, any of these other drugs. I surround myself with dry erase boards. I try to do everything I can to combat that, knowing that it's something I deal with short of drugs. Not, not saying that you're wrong to take drugs, not saying that I'm right in any way. I just wonder how these die, like where we're at on this issue, which is clearly a serious issue. It's always been an issue, but now with our culture and our phones, like where are you at with it? Do you feel settled when you hear a kid or when you want to diagnose and, and, and think about medication? It's, it's, it's a really important topic. And uh, I think we, we diagnose ADHD way too early. Mm. We medicate it way too early. We don't provide kids with the opportunities Ways to use apps on the phone, ways to use a dry erase board, which I actually love mm. as a tool in a kid's room, like a dry erase wall where they can keep track of things. The kids have the ability to focus and concentrate. I have worked with kids who absolutely have severe attention problems, but probably only four or five. In, in the years that I've been doing this, four or five where I thought, oh, maybe Adderall or Ritalin or, wow. or Focalin or something would be useful. The rest of the time... There's a lot of anxiety there. There's so much data coming at them. And if you can just teach them to organize, 
their thinking um, around all of that, which kids are really capable of doing. Their minds are really flexible when they're young, way more so than ours are. And if you can get there and get them to think differently, slow down the process a little bit, because like in the TikTok age, everything's moving so fast, right? And if you can get them to slow it down a little bit, then they can start to think things through. And I've watched this happen so many times. And so it, it frustrates me so much when my profession is, we are so guilty of this, of hyper-diagnosing, especially ADHD, like jumping out of that, especially with boys, and making that kind of their calling card. I can't really focus. I'm not that smart or whatever. I've got ADHD really bad. And the vast majority of the time, I find, mm, that's not really true. Mm. You're just not able to slow down and organize your thoughts. Let's work on that. And it honestly isn't that hard, Pete. It's pretty, it's not that difficult to get there with a kid. It takes a little patience. It takes a couple of months to get there, but they can do it. And it's a really important way to teach themselves how competent they are. I am so excited to have discovered your work and to get your books and to talk to you again. And I'm so grateful that you joined me today. Thank you so much. I hope you'll come back the next time you have uh, an hour free, which looks like never with all of your work. Thank you. But I would jump at the, at the opportunity. It's been really fun talking with you. Awesome. Well, there you go. Dr. John Duffy, please go get his books. Let him know that you heard him here on the show. Check out his podcast, of course, drjohnduffy.com and learn more about him. Reach out to him and learn more as I so did. And hopefully you did as well during that conversation. All right. Back to Vegas and pod jam and getting ready. And that's it. That's all I've got for you today. I'm hoping to post something tomorrow. We'll see if I can get around to getting it up, but I'm glad I got this here for you. And I hope that you liked it. Thank you so, 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 so much. I love you. You're the greatest. Bye-bye.
Listen well and it'll tell you not to run and hide. It says stand. 